Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Diet and Gene Interaction in the Control of Central Cell Metabolism, presented by Sophie Prosilek, PhD student, Quadrum Institute Bioscience, University of East Anglia. I'm Alexis Kraus of Labris, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labris and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Sophie Prosilek. Sophie is a BBRSC funded PhD student studying the role of dietary compounds and the genetic control of cell metabolism at the Quadrum Institute UK. Aside from her research duties, Sophie is a keen science communicator. As city coordinator for the Pint of Science Outreach Festival and chair founder of the UEA Science Communication Society, Sophie manages various public engagement initiatives which she advertises through local TV radio and print media streams. By combining her scientific expertise with a fierce passion for adult education and lifelong learning, Sophie hopes to integrate her research career with media production for mass education post-PhD. Sophie, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Welcome to my webinar entitled Diet and Gene Interactions in the Control of Central Cell Metabolism. I'm Sophie Prosolek, based at the Quadrum Institute in Norwich. And today's webinar, I'm going to first give you an introduction into our research group here, what we do and our expertise. I'm going to talk about bioactive compounds from broccoli, uh, what those bioactive compounds are, and more importantly, how we, map, how we analyze the metabolic effects of those broccoli bioactives. I'm also going to talk a little bit about a gene called PAPOG and its implication with diet and health. I'm going to first introduce what PAPOG is and how we explore its role in cancer metabolism. Then I'm going to end with the question, could we cure cancer with broccoli? And that's not quite as crazy as it sounds. So as promised, a little bit about me. I'm a third year PhD student based at the Quadrum Institute in Norwich in the UK. I started my PhD in 2015 and um, my current project, surprise, surprise, focuses on the role of broccoli bioactives and RNA turnover in metabolic control. So I study for my BSc in biomedicine here in Norwich at the University of East Anglia and decide, decided to stay here um, for my PhD. Um, in my spare time, I'm a passionate science communicator um, as city coordinator for the Pint of Science Outreach Festival. Um, basically, I get scientists to come into the pub and speak to the general public about their research. I've been doing that since 2017. Um, and I'm also an activist for the protection and inclusion of neurodiversity in research. So um, follow me on Twitter if you want to find out about any of that. Um, I'm quite an active tweeter and I love to hear from you, um, your thoughts on my webinar and just general chit chat really. Um, so also a little bit about our group. Um, we're a mixed group of um, human biologists, clinicians, plant biologists, and we're supported by a fantastic bioinformatician and two analytical chemists. We're very lucky here in Norwich that we have a very broad um, range of expertise across the Norwich Research Park. We work with clinicians from the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital and plant biologists from the John Innes Center, which we're luckily based just across the road from. And um, this sort of perfect storm of expertise has made our group um, particularly unique 
when it comes to studying bioactive compounds in foods, particularly crops, and um, the sort of clinical effects and outcomes of cancer research. So we investigate the role of broccoli bioactives in cell metabolism and cancer interception. So we use novel, novel broccoli cell lines developed by our group. As I mentioned, we work very closely with the John Innes Center, who are world famous for crop science. Um, and we, we use, as I say, these novel broccoli cell lines developed by Richard Mythen, who um, conventionally bred these broccoli lines, which are high in levels of glucosinolates, particularly glucoraphanin. Um, he, he bred these broccoli lines by conventional breeding techniques using um, ancestral broccoli lines and, and um, modern crops to enhance these levels of glucosinolates, which we use um, in human intervention studies. Like I say, these, these broccoli crops were bred to contain high levels of certain bioactive metabolites, and um, we basically turn them into soup, broccoli and stilton soup, which are great for human intervention studies. So one thing that's really unique about our group is that we use these human intervention studies to inform in vitro cell culture work. Usually when you think of translational biomedicine or translational research, you think of a bench to bedside approach. Well, we employ a bedside to bench approach so we can keep relevant. Um, and this, we find this is a really useful approach to cancer research using human intervention data to inform basic science research into diet and health. It keeps us relevant and um, it means that um, this sort of cross-disciplinary expertise can be sort of maximized to get um, the most we can out of our research. So uh, this one isn't a hard sell. A broccoli diet is associated with a reduced risk of cancer. We all know broccoli is good for us because it's green. Broccoli is rich in fiber, vitamins, minerals, um, but it also contains health-promoting bioactive compounds. So compounds are biologically active. A diet rich in broccoli is, reduced, is associated with a reduced risk of multiple cancers, including prostate, breast, lung. If there's a type of cancer for that sort of tissue, there's probably a study looking at broccoli bioactives and that kind of cancer. This is quite widely studied. Um, but anti-cancer properties of broccoli have largely been attributed to one class of compounds in particular uh, called glucosinolates, in particular glucoraphanin and its metabolite sulforaphane. So broccoli um, and other brassica vegetables, might I add, um, contain high levels of glucosinolates, but broccoli contains perhaps the most. Um, so we ingest these glucosinolates, or glucoraphanin, um, to name but one, when we eat broccoli. And upon mastication of the broccoli, um, the plant material, um, the vacuoles of the plant are broken, and um, enzymes which can convert glucoraphanin to its metabolite sulforaphane are released. Um, so there's some conversion of glucoraphanin to sulforaphane in the mouth, but also by our gut mi microbiota. Um, a lot of glucoraphanin is converted by the gut microbiota into sulforaphane, which can be absorbed in the lower gut. Sulforaphane then enters systemic circulation and um, can have all kinds of bioactive effects throughout the body. So sulforaphane is a potent activator of the NRF2 antioxidant response. So I could give an entire webinar, to be honest, on NRF2 and the antioxidant response, but that's kind of um, going into too much detail there is beyond the scope of, of this particular webinar. But basically what sulforaphane does is it conjugates to glutathione. Glutathione would usually uh, mop up reactive oxygen species. So the... Um, the binding of sulforaphane to glutathione changes the redox status of the cell, um, initially as a pro-oxidant, but this attunes the antioxidant response, the NRF2 antioxidant response to be specific, and um, upregulates the expression of detoxifying genes in the cell. So overall, sulforaphane, though acting initially as a pro-oxidant, is an antioxidant. And it's this antioxidant effect that um, we think is enough to 
push cancer over the edge. Um, sulforaphane has been um, shown as a promising novel therapy for cancer interception. We do run our own human intervention studies, but I'll, I'll just mention that in a second. Um, but there's a particularly interesting, um, interesting paper by Ho et al. that was published earlier this year um, detailing uh, the use of a broccoli diet in um, a targeted um, targeted treatment of colorectal cancer in mice. I really recommend if you're interested in diet and cancer interception, go and give that a read because it's a really exciting paper. So I promised I'd mention one of our human intervention studies and that was the ESCAPE study. So um, ESCAPE um, stands for somehow exploring broccoli diet in prostate cancer interception. I can't give you too many details on this because it's currently in review, but all I can say is look out for it. It's going to be exciting. Um, so men with prostate cancer were recruited um, to this intervention study where um, they were asked to consume one portion or 400 grams of broccoli and Stilton soup per week. So we looked at standard broccoli and then the high glucoraphanin um, broccoli that was developed by our group and we had a look at um, in the prostate biopsy in blood and urine um, gene expression and metabolite concentration and also cancer grade or who grade um, so you can find more details of this trial on clinicaltrials.gov um, the link is in the corner um, below and like I say, this one's going to be an exciting one when it comes out, so keep an eye out for that. So, um, as I mentioned, broccoli contains high levels of these glucosinolates, particularly glucoraphanin, which we know is bioactive against cancer, but broccoli also contains other bioactive compounds. Um, in addition to glucoraphanin, broccoli contains other sulfur metabolites, um, which are particularly abundant in, in brassica crops or broccoli crops. Um, and they're the compounds that if you've ever, um, if you've been cooking broccoli, they give it the distinct broccoli smell, the sulfurous smell that you get from cooking brassica, cooking cabbage, cooking broccoli. Um, and these, these sulfur-containing metabolites can be found in the prostate biopsies of men consuming the broccoli intervention diet, such as those on the ESCAPE study that I mentioned. Um, and these are the broccoli metabolites, one of which um, I have a, an example on the right-hand side here, um, can be broken down by the microbiota, just like glucoraphanin and sulforaphane. This example here, uh, S-methyl L-cysteine sulfoxide, can be broken down to daughter compounds, um, MMPSI and MMPSO, which um, literature details at high levels can be used um, as a bioactive to inform protein studies. Um, literature also reports anti-mutagenic and anti-diabetic effects of, of these various uh, broccoli sulfur metabolites in addition to sulforaphane. Um, but most of the studies um, on broccoli bioactives use superphysiological concentrations, much higher concentrations than you would get from a standard broccoli diet. Um, certainly higher concentrations than you'd get from that 400 grams uh, per week concentration uh, dosage that we give to um, the intervention, the intervention um, volunteers. So um, it's, they, keep, they use quite a reductionist model, really, um, looking at perhaps sulforaphane only, which, like I say, is widely studied, and looking at these super physiological concentrations, you have to kind of consider how relevant um, some of the current literature is if we're talking about diet and cancer interception. So it's really important for us to define our cell models um, to keep relevant to uh, whatever we're studying. Um, we have to choose carefully. And in our case, we chose PNT1A, immortalized human prostate epithelial cell lines and HEP-G2 immortalized um, human hepatocellular carcinoma cell line. Um, really, the value of, of using two cells, two cell lines is um, so that you can assess those mechanisms which are conserved amongst 
different tissues and those mechanisms which are divergent from tissue to tissue. Um, so you're able to compare and contrast. Um, and as well, an important decision for us in looking at um, liver cells, whilst we're researching prostate cancer, using a liver model helps us um, think about systemic metabolism, or it helps us think about, um, we can use varying glucose concentrations to mimic hyper or hypoglycemic diabetic states, and this allows us to test metabolic pathways in a way which we wouldn't probably do using just a prostate cell model. We also have um, normal hu human hepatocytes, THLE2 cells, which are immortalized cell line, or mouse primary hepatocytes available. Um, and we do dip in and out of using these models where we need a little bit of confirmation or backup to something that we may have already seen in another cell line. Um, so as I say, using multiple cell lines, um, means that you're able to compare and contrast across tissues and across cell types. Um, but these two cell lines that we've chosen, HEP G2 and PNT1A, are both highly glycolytic. So we can assess those mechanisms which are conserved, but, but also, also those which are divergent. Um, and, and by challenging these cells in different glucose environments, we're able to simulate uh, a diet or metabolic syndrome scenario. So next we need to define our treatments because we must answer a relevant biological question. Um, we need to think about the toxicity of these broccoli bioactives that we're treating ourselves with. Um, some of these bioactives um, cause toxicity in, in vitro when used at really high concentrations and that certainly is not physiologically relevant. So um, we need to investigate that before any sort of cell studies. So um, we culture cells and we measure uh, metabolic activity with a, a colorimetric change um, in WST1 reagent like this example that I have on the right here. So we treat with increasing concentrations or an increasing dosage of our compound of interest and then look at colorimetric change in WST1 reagent which is indicative of metabolic activity and a decrease in um, in viability or a decrease in metabolic activity um, indicates, as I have an example here, in viability. Now, this is a, a bit of a, you have to take this with a bit of a pinch of salt because we are looking at metabolically active um, compounds here. Um, but certainly when you have a metabolic activity which is decreased to sort of 10% of the original capacity, um, this can be considered indicative of, of, of cell death. Um, this is also really revealing in terms of which compounds we choose to study because uh, the plant metabolites themselves are not always directly responsible for their associated biological effect. As I mentioned earlier, glucoraphanin is converted to sulforaphane, SMCSO is converted to MMTSO and MMTSI, and it's not always a parent compound which is bioactive. Um, sometimes it's the daughter compound, and um, we've shown that, that these daughter metabolites are toxic beyond uh, 125 micromolar concentrations uh, in, in vitro, um, whereas the, the parent compound shows no toxic effect at all. And to show no toxic effect really suggests no biological activity at these sort of supraphysiological um, concentrations. So. We've defined our cell model, we've defined our cell treatment. So next, the question is, um, do sulfur metabolites um, from broccoli, do these broccoli bioactives alter metabolism? And, and well, they do, because, um, because I'm speaking to you here now. So um, we, we can use a, ver a variety of techniques, but um, our first port of call is really to look at a generalist approach to um, analyzing metabolism in these cell lines. And so we culture cells in microplates and treat with a physiological concentration of our compound, uh, which is informed by our human intervention studies, prostate biopsies, um, blood and urine samples. We can estimate um, physiological concentrations of these compounds, treat our cells in vitro, and then we use a machine called the Seahorse Extracellular Flux Analyzer to measure metabolic rate in live cells. 
So I love this machine. I think it's fantastic. It's really great at getting a, an overall snapshot of energy metabolism in live cells. Um, through the injection of drug compounds, oligomycin, FCCP, rotenone antamycin, um, we can really test metabolic capacity. So you culture your cells in these microplates, inject drug compounds over the course of the assay, and um, using a fluorescent probe, you measure extracellular acidification, uh, which is an indirect measurement of glycolysis, and oxygen consumption rate, which is an indirect measurement of mitochondrial respiration. Again, this is another thing that could have an entire webinar on itself, but um, information about this, this sort of assay um, can be found on the manufacturer's website, and it's really great, I think, for offering an overall snapshot of live cell metabolism. So, what does a seahorse assay look like? It looks like this. So, sulfur metabolites were shown to increase glycolytic rate, on, as you can see by ECAR on the left-hand side, and maximal mitochondrial capacity on the, on the right-hand side in PNT1A cells. So, compound-treated cells in red show an increased glycolytic rate and an increased maximal mitochondrial capacity compared to control-treated cells, uh, which are denoted in blue. So from there, we've had an overall snapshot of metabolism um, through this live cell energy phenotype. I, di I didn't mention there that um, th these measurements are taken in live cells of metabolism as it's happening, which is really cool. You can see this real-time change. But then once we've seen that, we want to have a look more specifically at what's going on with specific enzymes and um, probe metabolism a little bit more um, in a bit more of a detailed kind of way. So from there, we go to RNA level analysis. Um, again, with cultured cells, um, treat them with our compound of interest, extract RNA, and then we can choose to do QRT-PCR for target gene expression or whole genome RNA sequencing. We do both. Um, I have just sent some samples off to Macrogen for sequencing, um, but also um, the individual gene expression. And, and looking at these differential gene expressions helps us identify pathways and networks which are affected um, by our compound treatment. So I did some QRT-PCR for so glycolytic enzymes, again in prostate, epithelial, immortalized cell lines, PNT1A cells treated with compound, and we saw a dose-dependent increase in these glycolytic enzymes. So it appears from our seahorse assay and from our targeted um, gene expression analysis that our compound of interest, our sulfur metabolite, is increasing glycolysis in PNT1A cells. So by increasing glycolysis in these cells, um, could this compound support cancer interception? Well, to answer that, we need to understand a little bit about the pathogenesis of prostate cancer. So cancer is a largely metabolic disease, and cancer cells exhibit the Warburg effect. So unhealthy metabolism, glucose is converted to pyruvate, and then that's shunted into um, the TCO cycle and oxidative phosphorylation to generate lots of ATP. This is normal under um, conditions with oxygen, um, but the Warburg effect basically means that in those same oxygenated conditions, um, cells are preferentially metabolizing in an anaerobic kind of way. Cells uh, prefer preferentially respire with non-mitochondrial respiration, even in the presence of oxygen. And mitochondrial metabolism um, is perturbed in, in the Warburg effect. So cells become sort of addicted to glycolytic substrates like glucose or glutamine. And these high rates of glycolysis are thought to generate metabolites needed for anabolic processes, um, notably cell growth in cancer. Um, but interestingly, prostate cancer does not exhibit the Warburg effect. Um, prostate epithelial tissue um, does, uh, utilize glu glu does utilize glycolysis um, to generate citrate, an important constituent of seminal fluid. And this is a normal function, normal healthy function of prostate epithelial tissue. So um, by increasing glycolysis, are we in fact increasing uh, the normal healthy functions of this prostate epithelial tissue and contributing to cancer interception. Is that possible? 
So we also have to think about systemic metabolic health as well as cellular metabolic health um, in cancer prevention because obesity and poor metabolic health is also a risk factor for cancer pathogenesis. And surprise, surprise, broccoli diet is associated with improved metabolic health. This is another one of our studies, our human intervention studies, um, where we use, again, high glucoraphane broccoli, and uh, this delivers increased levels of dietary sulforaphane. And we saw that um, volunteers on this diet were uh, showing improved markers of metabolic health, but they showed also a clustered metabolic response correlated with polymorphisms in, a, in this gene known as PAPOG. So could PAPOG influence the cellular and systemic metabolism and be causing these clustered metabolic responses that we saw in our intervention study? Well, we need to know first what PAPOG is. And that's been a challenge. PAPOG is a poly-A polymerase, poly-A polymerase gamma to be specific, and um, it's, it's largely understudied to be honest. It catalyzes the sequential addition of adenine residues to RNA transcripts. So it's denoted here on the right-hand side as PAP poly A polymerase, and it forms part of this um, cleavage and polyadenylation um, complex, which is responsible for post-translational modification of RNA transcripts. So it confers stability or signals transcript for degradation, um, depending on the poly A tail length or, or poly A pattern. And this potentially affects a, a range of pathways within the cell. And um, one thing that's interesting about PAPOG is that it's overexpressed in many cancers, um, many cancers. And um, as we've demonstrated from our human, human intervention study, SNPs within this gene um, appear to be correlated with metabolic health. So what's the metabolic role of PAPOG? To investigate this, we used HEPG2 and PNT1A cells again, transfected with siRNA, small interfering RNA. So these are small RNA, um, RNA nucleotides uh, of about 20, 25 nucleotides in length, um, and they complementary base pair to your gene of interest and signal it for degradation. So the overall effect of using an siRNA is that your gene of interest uh, is, is abrogated, the expression is abrogated. Um, it's not knocked down completely, but it's significantly reduced. And um, you can then run comparative assays on your cell population to antagonize what the effect of this gene might be. Um, so we did exactly that. We um, cultured cells and prepared lysates um, of, of cultures treated with siRNA. And then we looked at a targeted analysis of metabolite levels using LCMS. As I said, we're supported here by um, some very talented chemists um, who, who help very much with, um, with um, protocol development and, and the LCMS side of things. But then there's also the option of high throughput metabolomics, and we have, we have sent off samples um, to Metabolon in the past. Um, so we measured multiple metabolic intermediates in um, a, a sample of either cells or, or media by LCMS. And um, we can show that when normalized to cell number, there's a decrease in metabolite concentrations following gene knockdown. This was representative of, um, of various metabolites um, across um, TCA cycle. And um, so this helps us identify where there might be enzymatic bottlenecks in, in the pathway. And um, as I mentioned earlier, sulforaphane, for example, affects the redox status of a cell. So these are often redox-sensitive enzymes. So to summarize, we've demonstrated that, that, more, that there are multiple bioactives uh, that can be derived from a broccoli diet. And that um, glucoraphanin, as an example, is already well studied, but there are other sulfur containing metabolites that perhaps warrant further study. We've reported on the bioactivity of um, certain sulfur containing plant metabolites, um, identifying that it's often the daughter compounds 
not the parent compound that is responsible for the biological effects. And that these metabolites fundamentally alter energy metabolism in vitro of um, both normal and, and cancer cell lines. We've demonstrated um, that this broccoli diet may interact with genotypes, notably the genotype of PAPORG2, to cause inter-individual variation in the response to a broccoli diet. And um, of course, we've identified a novel metabolic role for an RNA polyapolymerase that had not previously been associated with metabolic control. So this really tells us that we need a multi-dimensional approach to cell-based research. Um, broccoli contains multiple potent bioactives, uh, which, have a, which could have a synergistic effect in, in vivo. And many in vitro studies have not taken this into account. They've taken a reductionist approach, focusing on one bioactive only. Um, but our research demonstrates the pitfalls of that um, in, in nutrition research, because, of course, we are looking at a whole food matrix and human intervention studies, we need to consider all the bioactives within that food matrix, along with consumer genotype, of course, because we're all different. So by translating our research sort of from bedside to bench, we can narrow down a physiological scope of our research, maintaining clinical relevance even at the level of um, cell culture studies. So we go from clinical trial to in vitro experimental design, and then we can take a targeted nutrigenetic approach. And um, this all supports the potential role of broccoli diet in cancer interception. So I'm going to leave you with the question, could we cure cancer with broccoli? Well, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk um, that paper by Ho et al. in which they look at sulforaphane in colorectal cancer interception in mice. Well, could we also do the same with other um, sulfur-derived um, broccoli metabolites? Uh, sulfur-containing broccoli metabolites, I should say, um, could we take the same approach? Could the approach be enhanced by looking at multiple metabolites and the cumulative synergistic effect? Um, of course, um, diet is a way that everyone, in theory, can maintain their own health and um, and um, keep, keep uh, metabolic diseases at bay. Um, so could we cure cancer with broccoli? We'll see. Wait for the escape paper. Any questions? Thank you, Sophie, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, there have been many cell studies using sulforaphane treatments to model the benefits of a broccoli diet. How relevant are these studies now we know there are multiple bioactives which may act synergistically? Right, so I think that those sulforaphane treatments um, and cell studies are still extremely relevant as much of what we understand about the health benefits of broccoli are, are based upon what, what we learned about sulforaphane in cell studies. It's, it's still extremely relevant. However, I think it's really important um, as research progresses that we consider um, the whole food matrix um, and that means multiple bioactives when considering a dietary intervention because, of course, the person is consuming the whole food. Now, Sophie, why did you use siRNA to create a PAPOLG knockdown when there are CRISPR alternatives available? So this is quite a good question because um, CRISPR has gained a lot of publicity in recent years. Um, about being superior to siRNA in, in knockdown experiments. But I think it really depends what question you're asking. Um, really, do you want to spend a lot of money on an expensive CRISPR system, which might be really great if you're looking at mul multiple knockdowns or doing this in a, a high throughput scenario? Um, but I think when taking um, a knockdown that hasn't really been studied before, of course, you don't know if it's going to be toxic to your cell. Mm -hmm. 
um, an siRNA is sufficient just to abrogate expression and give you an insight before you sort of take the plunge with with more committal CRISPR steps. And what level of papillary knockdown did you achieve with your siRNA? Um, so we managed to get about 40% um, of initial expression. So the gene was knocked down by about 60% in, in both the cell lines that we used the siRNA in. And Sophie, our next question. What are the challenges of designing a long-term human intervention study with food? Um, that's another good question because there are many challenges. Um, of course, the first being compliance. Um, people need to, if, if this is a long-term study, um, adhere to a diet long-term. And yeah, that's sometimes difficult. Um, and in the example of our escape study, we were giving um, patients one portion of broccoli soup per week. So it really has to be something that's, um, that's doable if we'd ask them to consume, I don't know, a portion a day, we might have really not had very good compliance. Um, and of course, the way you check compliance is usually through food diaries. Um, and people people tell fibs, to be honest. People don't want to tell you that they've had, you know, six portions of chips a week. They want to tell you that they've eaten apples and all the healthy things. Um, so sometimes the food diaries can be a little bit misleading. Um, and of course, um, the controls. How do you control for broccoli uh, without it <laughs> without it being broccoli? So this is one of the um, real strengths of our group, um, in that we have the high glucose glucosinolate broccoli and the standard broccoli. So we have a standard control, um, which is sometimes difficult with some foods. We are getting some great questions here, Sophie. Um, let's look at this one. Sophie, have you watched The Magic Pill? Premises that eating the correct food can be superior to drug intervention. The phrase, you are what you eat. So what is your opinion on diet as preventing as well as treating disease? Well, that's a good one. Um, of course, diet keeps your body healthy. Um, a healthy diet means a healthy body in, in many circumstances. Of course, that's not the case for everybody. Um, but I think it really is important to focus on prevention rather than treatment um, in, in sort of particularly, um, you know, as, as people are living longer and there's um, an increased burden on, on the health service um, and, and the focus tends towards healthy aging, I think diet is, is crucial, um, not just for um, sort of um, the purse strings of, of the health service, but also for um, the psyche of the patient or, or to be patient. You want to avoid medicalizing people where possible, and I think this is where dietary intervention has a real power. Now, Sophie, what are the challenges of designing a long-term human intervention? Oh, excuse me, we, we, <laughs> we, we did already <laughs> ask that one. Yes, we did. All right, well, let's move on to our next one, which is, are animal models always relevant as an intermediate between cell studies and human intervention studies? Now, this is another one that depends very much um, on the experimental design and um, the variable which you're experimenting. We're lucky in that we study broccoli, and like I said in my presentation, that's not a hard cell. You're not going to do any damage with one portion of broccoli soup a week um, in a human. So we're lucky in that we can translate our cell studies pretty much straight into into humans um, but of course it depends exactly on what you're looking at I don't think it's always relevant as an intermediate but it does depend what you're looking at and, and the nature of your study design and it looks like we are we are going to be getting a couple more questions in um, our next one is broccoli class as a superfood and what are the other foods in this category for cancer Ooh, um, well, of course, um, our research group has developed this high glucoraphanin broccoli, which I would consider a superfood. I don't know if superfood is a more like a marketing term, um, but there, there's numerous foods that you can consider superfoods, broccoli perhaps being one, um, but others are um, 
foods which contain high levels of anthocyanins, for example. Anthocyanins are, are generally purple colored compounds, which are found in like aubergine skins, um, to an extent in tomatoes. There's a study um, in collaboration with the Quadrum Institute and the John Innes Center here in Norwich, uh, which um, looks at high anthocyanin tomatoes, for example, um, in, in um, cardiovascular disease risk. Um, so purple foods are good for you. They can be considered superfoods, um, broccoli, and um, yeah, yeah. As a little bit of a piggyback to that question, um, what about blackberries? Ooh, um, blackberries, I'm pretty sure do contain anthocyanins, um, but I'm not sure how many, how, what, what volume of anthocyanin they contain. Like I say, it's generally purple compounds, but purple foods generally contain varying levels of anthocyanin, so um, yeah. Not sure, but, but I, know, I know they contain anthocyanins, but I'm not sure at, at what level. All right. It looks like we ha do have another question right here. Is sulfurane elevate the oxidative stress level in both of the tested cell lines? Pardon? Sorry? <laughs> it's oh, it's okay. Right. Is sulfurane elevating the oxidative stress level in both the tested cell lines. Um, yes. So this is how sulforaphane actually works in, within the cell. Um, what it does is it, um, it combines a glutathione, um, which means there's less glutathione available to mop up reactive oxygen species. So initially, it sort of increases the oxidative stress level a little bit, um, which is enough to attune the antioxidant response. So it does, in, this is the general action of sulforaphane within any cell as far as I understand, um, that it initially acts as a little bit of a pro-oxidant, but its overall effect within various cell lines is antioxidant. All right, let's see if we have any more questions here. Okay, what, we do have another one. Are other greens beneficial, uh, for example, spinach, kale, or arugula? So that's an interesting one because um, spinach and kale are sort of in the same, um, kale certainly is in the same um, family of vegetable as broccoli, um, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, Chinese cabbage, I think. Um, yeah, they're, they're all within the same sort of um, brassica family, and they all contain glucosinolates, but broccoli contains the most, so that's why we choose to study broccoli. Here's a question for you, Sophie. What are your next steps in your research? Oh, um, that's an interesting one. Uh, so the next steps in my research, um, so I'm looking at other sulfur met metabolites um, from broccoli, and I have some indication that some may affect um, NRF2 signaling. I might want to explore that. Um, also, I want to explore how um, these sulfur compounds affect um, protein structures um, and whether they, they promote this sort of antioxidant response from other sulfur metabolites as well as sulforaphane. So that's something I'm quite interested in also. Um, yeah, there's always a million directions you can take. We do have another question, and in, um, in response to our audience, if there are questions that we do not have time for today, um, we will be able to, uh, Sophie will be able to answer them via email after this presentation is over. So Sophie, our next question. What is the effect of sulfurane on NRF2? Oh, this is a good one. It, sulforaphane is the most potent activator of NRF2. Um, there's a lot of literature on that. If you Google that, you'll come up with so much literature, you won't know what to read first. Um, any cell line, any tissue, you name it, there's been studies on sulforaphane and NRF2. All right, so... Let's look and see if we have any more questions. Um, let's go ahead and, again, like I said to our audience who may have put in some questions that we just did not have time for, we, we, uh, Sophie will answer questions after, um, after our presentation. 
um, provided with the, um, the contact information that you provided at the beginning of the presentation. So thank you again, Sophie. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, final comments, feel free to give me an email or even tweet me if you've got another question that comes up after, afterwards. Um, I'm, like I say, I'm a fairly prolific tweeter and happy to respond to any questions via email. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of the registration. We would like to thank Labert and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through December of 2018. Labert will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time. Goodbye.